what we're trying to do is, it says without finding a primitive. So um, what, what does that mean? Like that first part of the statement. Um, you know when we differentiate a function, you're finding a derivative and you're using all of your calculus stuff like, you know, bring the index out the front, you know, divide, multiply by the index, all that kind of thing. So with integrating, we can do that by finding a primitive, which is some of that stuff which you saw in the exam. You know, it's like, oh, if I have, if I have for example, the integral of x to the power of 5 with respect to x, then we do all of this stuff reversing all of the rules that we learned before. So I would increase the index and then I would divide by that index. Then I add my constant of integration. Okay, so what I've just found there is the primitive function. Now what they're suggesting in this question is, hey, can you find out the values of these definite integrals without going through that process? Is there other knowledge you can use without having to resort to um, all this fancy calculus and all that kind of thing. So let's have a go at, um, at well, let's just start at part B. Oh, I said part C is the one I want to start with, okay? So we're integrating from negative one to one, and the function they're interested in is x cubed, okay? Now, to have a go at this, you do need to remember some of the um, properties of definite integrals, which I'll review for you in a second. That's the first piece of knowledge you'll need in the back of your mind. And the second thing is, it is immensely helpful with virtually all of these to have a kind of picture in your mind as well. So the question doesn't ask you to draw this, but um, as you'll see in a second, once you draw it, it's kind of like, oh, Oh, is that what they mean? And it kind of means you don't have to remember a list of arbitrary properties, which can be quite hard. The visual itself tells you what's going on, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna draw a really quick and dirty sketch of um, this function in here, um, x cubed, because that's the thing that I'm being asked to have a look at um, in relation to its area, okay? So I'm just gonna do this underneath here. Wow, that's a terribly not straight line. That's much better. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna draw a rough plot of this x cubed graph. It's gonna look roughly like this. Um, not my best work, but um, it's, it's close enough for me to be happy with. And I need to think about what the question asks me to focus on in relation to this graph, okay? Now, remember, they're integrating from negative one to one. That's what those boundaries are, okay? So what they're saying is, for the x value negative one, and the x value one, we're looking at the area connected between this graph and the x axis. Um, I know it's the x axis because of this part along the end of the integral here. It says dx, which means, hey, compare this graph to the x axis, right? So if I draw a few lines here to help us out, switch over color, from negative one, to one, you can see it encloses this area between the black graph and the red x axis. And I'm gonna shade in the part that's relevant. Let's uh, choose a color like that. Might make it a bit narrower. So here is the area from negative one. I'm going from the left to the right, and then I go forward all the way up until one, okay? so. This is what the integral is asking us to focus on. Hey, can you tell me something about this area? Now, the tricky thing with integrals, or I would say tricky but also powerful, is that unlike in normal measurement where we say uh, lengths and areas have to be positive, in integration we have these things called signed areas. Um, signed as in uh, positive or negative. Which is to say, when you've got this area on the left hand side, I hope you notice that when you compare that to the x axis, this area is beneath the x axis. Um, that's negative. So this area here is actually going to count for a negative result. Over here, this area is positive because it's above the axis. So when I put these two together, there's gonna be an addition and a subtraction happening. Now, hopefully, even though my graph is not beautiful, you can tell that because this is a special kind of function, the area on the left, this one here, and the area on the right, they are actually the same in size. Yeah, exactly, Abby, well done. Um, they are gonna be the same areas, um, at least in terms of their size. So because one's positive, one's negative, it's like, oh, you add, add five, take away five, or add four, take away four, and that's why you're actually just gonna get zero. So no fancy calculus required on that. Um, so the way that we would say it is, it's exactly right. Well done, Abby, you're reading my mind. This is an odd function. There's uh, a rotational symmetry to this. So you're always going to get this result zero if your boundaries are symmetrical.
So before I do another example question, um, I just want you to have a look at the rest of the questions that you can see in part, uh, in number seven, you've got A, B, C, D, E, F. Do you see any others that are going to follow that same kind of pattern where you've got an odd function, so you've got this kind of symmetry to it? Do you see which other parts we just saw C? Which other ones are gonna be like that? Yes, C. D, E, well done, um, and F, oh well, fantastic. Now this is um, really interesting, I'm gonna um, pull you up on this for a second. So how do we know that different functions are odd? Well, um, C, one of the reasons why we call it odd symmetry is because X cubed, um, <laughs> Abby's not sure that's okay, I'll, I'll help you out, all right? Um, odd symmetry is partly named because it comes from odd polynomials, or I should say polynomials which have an odd power. So you can see up here, right? You've got x cubed here. Um, that x cubed, because it's an odd number, it's going to have odd symmetry. If you have a look at part d, you'll notice you've got the same, I shouldn't go right over it, you've got the same odd power there. Um, 25x, this is a bit sneaky, it's also got an odd power, but it's just kind of hiding, right? It's a 1. So that power there is also odd. Um, I can do some, you know, sort of um, fancy proofs for you to show you the mechanics underneath this if you like, but the most important thing for you to get down for now, and I'll write this down for you, is that um, when you add odd functions together, the sum of odd functions give you an odd function in total. Should write the sum, that would be more helpful. Uh, let me move this out so it's a little bit neater because I don't have enough space here. So if you have a bunch of odd functions and you add them together, um, x cubed, x to the power of five, x to the power of seven, um, sine x is another one, um, you're going to get an odd function as a result. So that's how we know um, that part C and D are odd. Um, sine x, how do we know that that's odd? This is kind of relying, like I said before, on a sense of the image in your mind of what the graph looks like, okay? So I wonder if you could draw, a, a, again, a quick and dirty version of this graph. I'm gonna draw here. Sine x is gonna look something like this. I'm gonna be really, really, cheap and sort of take advantage of the fact that I can duplicate. Okay, so yeah, it's not too bad, okay? So what you've got here, you can see there's that same symmetry there. So if we consider from, they want 90 degrees, so that's over here, and also negative 90, which is over here. You can see again, if I shade this area here, and this one here are equal in size or equal in magnitude, um, but one's negative, one's positive. So yes, they're odd because the powers are odd. Now the last one there, F, to be fair on you, this is actually very sneaky here. We haven't really covered that. Um, yes, Abby, it is always, if they've got odd powers, you will always get an odd function um, with odd symmetry out of that. And actually I'd encourage you to go and um, go into Desmos, where's mine gone? Here it is. Go into Desmos and just have a bit of a fiddle. Like here's x cubed, a much better version than the one that I drew before. And you can see it's got this um, uh, symmetry to it. But if you change that power up there to any odd number that you like, we could make that five. Um, you could even, if you wanted to be really sneaky, um, you could put in negative numbers there so long as they're odd and you'll still get that odd symmetry. So um, yes, you're always gonna get that. In fact, that's why they're called, why well, it's called an odd function. Um, sine x, like we're coming back to, we had a look at this one. And then I said, I already got ahead of myself. When you're having a look at part f, this is really, really sneaky. So I want you to look carefully at it, okay? Um, focus first on the numerator and then we'll get to the denominator. This function in the numerator, is it odd or even? Have a think about it. Well done, it's odd. Okay, so I'm just gonna write that up the top. This is an odd function. Now, what about the one in the denominator? This, whoop, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, what about this guy here, one plus x squared? That's an even function, right? Now, what would that mean? What would that result give us? Well, it just so turns out, when you take an odd function and you multiply it by an even function, or divide it by an even function for that matter, what you get is odd, and I'll show you right now. Let's go over back to Desmos. Oh, my Desmos has gone a bit funny. There we go, full screen, there we are. So I think the function from memory was x divided by one plus x squared. So let's go ahead and put that in, x 
squared. Okay, now this this is a weird looking guy, isn't it? Okay, so we haven't really looked closely at how to uh, graph functions like that. Is it a raised parabola? Well, um, the denominator one plus x squared is a raised parabola, but when you combine it with this x divided by one plus x squared, you get this weird little beast here, okay? So an odd function divided by an even function is another odd function. Um, this is, this is kind of weird and crazy and to prove it, um, I, actually what I will do is after this, um, so that you can speed it up, slow it down as you prefer, I'll, I'll go ahead and prove that the sum of odd functions will give you an odd function. And also if you multiply or divide on an even functions, you can work out things about whether the whole result like this x over one plus x squared is odd or even. In this case, as you can clearly see from the image, the blue graph there, um, the result you get is odd. So therefore, if you go from negative two, um, there's negative two there, let me write on this. Okay, uh, negative two, let's choose a helpful color. There's negative two over there. And there's two. So when you're doing, when you're comparing the areas from negative two to two, um, you're still going to have an area over here that's the same in size as this one over here, but one's positive, one's negative. I guess you could say they cancel out. Yes, exactly, it's zero again. So in these cases, what you're taking advantage of is these um, properties of definite integrals. Let's just get that out of the way. Um, you don't have to know how to integrate x over one plus x squared, which is good because I actually need some really fancy techniques from extension two to be able to do that. So hopefully that makes sense. Actually, I take that back. This one's easy. It ends up with a log. So that's what I get for uh, not paying close attention to the function. So anyhow, there's the result. Um, let us know if that's, if you require any extra clarification on that, but hopefully that takes you through most of seven. Or well, maybe I will just quickly come back. A and B, have a look at those. Um, look closely at them. Again, the whole point is that you have this messy looking thing, but if you think carefully about what's being asked of you, it ends up actually being straightforward. Look closely for a minute. Okay, yeah, sure, all right. So you, you mean, wait, hold on, that X squared, are you talking about part A in that one? There's a, yeah, okay, great. So um, you've got the X squared there, you've got the three X squared, so you're right, you're like, oh, these are not going to be just odd or just even functions again, unless I look more closely. Part B is a mixture of odd and even functions, right? So in this case, rather than have a look, yeah, you've got to look closely at the boundaries, right? So for A and B, you're integrating from, well in A, it's from three to three, and then from B, it's from four to four. So in other words, you're looking for an area, but you start somewhere and then you end somewhere. So can I call your mind back? I wonder if I have it in this actual page. I don't think I do. Let me find the right one for you. Here it is, okay. So do you remember when we did this lesson and we were looking at the fundamental theorem of calculus? Does this ring a bell? I'm um, looking at this curve, thinking about, you know, what the coronavirus looked like. Okay, perfect, all right. Now, we said that um, looking at an integral gives you the area under the curve, right? And I said, if you wanna work out the area under the curve, you can go back to the primitive function and just compare your start point and your end point. Well, the start point and the end point are the same place, right? When you're looking at those two questions, you're going from three to three, or four to four. So what's the, what's the total change? That was that, let me go to that big table that we drew here, right? Um, the meaning of the integral is what's the net amount of change? You're like, well, I didn't change at all because the place that I started, the place that I ended um, is exactly the same. So that's why you end up getting an answer of zero. So this is a hilarious part in the solutions to look at because parts A through F, the answers are all zero. You're like, I can't believe I did that much work to get zero six times. So does that make sense, Abby? You happy with that?